15 years of marriage, three kids, a life built on shared memories, struggles, and dreams. I thought my wife and I were solid. Sure, we had our ups and downs like any couple, but I never doubted her loyalty. That was until four days ago, when I discovered the truth about her affair. It started a few years back when we met her affair partner, AP. He wasn't exactly someone I would have imagined entering our circle. Recently released from prison for an inappropriate sexual assault charge, an inappropriate massage, as it was put, he seemed like a man humbled by his experience. He was living with his ex-mother-in-law, who ran a Great Dane rescue where my wife volunteered. She and AP bonded over their shared brushes with the law. My wife had been through her own legal troubles, and they found common ground in their mutual disdain for how the system had treated them. As time went on, they became friends, and I didn't think much of it. My wife had always been a social person, so I didn't mind when she hung out with AP without me. I trusted her, and AP's history, while a bit troubling, didn't raise any immediate alarms. He was a nice guy, humble, polite, and the fact that he was hanging out with my wife didn't bother me initially. Fast forward a year, and things had changed. The three of us, along with a group of friends, spent every Saturday at a local bar, drinking, playing darts, and singing karaoke. It became a routine. AP and my wife grew closer, and she started referring to him as her best friend. At first, I didn't see any harm in it. We had been together for so long, and I didn't think she'd betray me. I was secure in our relationship, or so I thought. But then, the late-night bar hopping started. Twice, sometimes three times a week, my wife and AP were out until one or two in the morning, often without me. The first time I brought it up, she accused me of being jealous. He's just my friend, she would say, her words laced with annoyance. You're just upset because my best friend is a man. The more I pushed, the more defensive she became. 2024 had been a rough year for us. With each passing month, I felt like I was losing her. The connection that once held us together was unraveling, and I had no idea why. She was living a life she seemed to have missed in her 20s. Late nights, freedom, and excitement. And I was left behind, raising our kids and keeping our household together. One night, after another argument about her late-night outings with AP, I felt a creeping doubt. Something was off, and I couldn't shake the feeling. She had a password on her iPhone, one I didn't know, but I did know the password to her MacBook. I hated the idea of snooping. It felt wrong, a violation of trust. But something inside me needed answers. Against my better judgment, I opened her computer and searched through her WhatsApp messages with AP. I typed in a few keywords, love, secret, meet, hoping I wouldn't find anything. But what I found shattered my world. There they were. Messages between my wife and AP, explicit, detailed descriptions of their sexual encounters. It wasn't just once, it was multiple times, spread over the course of a year. Each message was a dagger to my heart, confirming what I had feared the most. I quickly took pictures of the conversations, closed her computer and walked away, my hands trembling, my chest tight with rage and sorrow. She was out with him at that very moment. I stood there shaking, wanting to scream, to cry, to tear the house apart. But I knew I couldn't act impulsively. My kids were home, and they didn't deserve to see their father break down like this. Instead, I bottled it up. I held on to the rage, the betrayal, and the devastation, letting it simmer as I formulated my plan. I couldn't just confront her in the heat of the moment. I needed to handle this carefully. The next day I left work early. I knew they were together, just like they always were when the kids were at school. I checked the ring camera and saw them both walking into the house with grocery bags. A twisted part of me found it ironic that they were shopping for my family while carrying on their affair behind my back. I waited until she dropped him off at his house before I made my move. I texted AP, asking if I could stop by and show him something. He agreed, completely unaware of what was coming. When I pulled up to his house, I was shaking with anger, but forced myself to remain calm. The kids didn't need to lose both their fathers dignity, and their sense of security in one explosive moment. AP came out to meet me, and for a moment, I was tempted to lash out. I wanted to hit him, to scream, to unleash the fury that had been building inside me since the moment I found those messages. But I didn't. Instead, I pulled out my phone, opened the pictures of their conversations, and held them up for him to see. His face drained of color. I could see the fear in his eyes, the realization that his world was about to come crashing down. I didn't say a word as he stared at the images, his hands trembling as he took it all in. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, 
he confessed. It had been going on for a year. They had slept together five times, each time in secret, each time under my nose. He tried to apologize, stammering out excuses and weak explanations, but I wasn't interested. I told him flat out that I could destroy his life, report his probation violations, and have him sent back to prison if he ever came near my family again. He was scared. I could see it in the way his body sagged, the way his voice cracked as he mumbled more apologies. But apologies weren't enough. Nothing would ever be enough. The damage was done, and there was no undoing it. As I drove home, my mind raced with the next step, confronting my wife. She was still at home, likely oblivious to the fact that her little secret had been exposed. I didn't rush. I wanted to time it right. I waited until the kids were out of the house, off to their sports practices and work, leaving us alone. When I walked through the door, she was sitting on the couch, her face lit by the glow of her phone. She didn't even notice me at first. I stood there, silently watching her for a moment letting the weight of the betrayal hang in the air between us. Finally, I spoke. We need to talk. She looked up, startled by the seriousness in my voice. What's going on? I didn't waste any time. I pulled out my phone and showed her the pictures, the same ones I had shown AP. Her eyes widened in shock, then narrowed in anger. You went through my computer? She spat, as if that were the real betrayal here. I couldn't believe it. Even when faced with undeniable proof of her affair, she was more concerned about me invading her privacy. But as the conversation dragged on, her anger faded, replaced by guilt and remorse. Tears streamed down her face as she apologized over and over again, saying it had never been meant to happen, that it had just spiraled out of control. She swore she loved me, that she couldn't imagine her life without me. But all I could hear were the words from those texts, her telling him that she loved him, that he made her feel alive. I felt like I was suffocating. The woman I had trusted, the mother of my children, had torn apart our family, and now she was trying to salvage what was left. But there was nothing to salvage. She had made her choice, and now she would have to live with the consequences. After confronting my wife and hearing her tearful apologies, I knew that her remorse, however genuine it seemed, wasn't enough to heal the damage she had done. Her betrayal had been too deep, too painful for me to simply walk away and move on. Every time I closed my eyes I saw the messages, the late-night outings, the years of deception. I needed more than closure. I needed revenge. As the days passed, I began to plot. My anger simmered beneath the surface, but I kept it controlled. I knew that if I wanted to make her feel even a fraction of the pain she had caused me, I had to be careful. This wasn't going to be a simple outburst or a quick confrontation. No, this would be methodical, precise. I would take my time, ensuring that when everything fell apart for her, it would be complete, leaving no room for her to rebuild the life she had so easily destroyed. I spent hours in quiet contemplation, planning every detail. My wife still didn't know the extent of what I had uncovered. She believed that our confrontation was the end of it, that I was simply going through the motions of dealing with her infidelity before we inevitably separated. But she didn't know that I had already taken steps to ensure she would lose far more than just our marriage. The first part of my plan involved gathering more evidence. I had already saved the messages from WhatsApp, but I wanted more. I needed to dig deeper, to uncover every lie she had told, every secret she had hidden. The more ammunition I had, the better. So, I started monitoring her movements more closely. I didn't confront her about her continued contact with AP, but I knew they were still speaking. She didn't realize it, but every message they exchanged, every phone call, was now being logged. I installed spyware on her phone, capturing everything as it happened. I made sure to keep my actions discreet. She couldn't know that I was preparing for the final blow. As I gathered information, I also began reaching out to people, family, friends, even some of our mutual acquaintances. Slowly, I started to plant seeds of doubt. I didn't outright tell them what she had done, not yet, but I subtly hinted that things weren't as they seemed. A quiet word here, a vague comment there. It was enough to make them start questioning her behavior, her late-night outings, her excuses. The hardest part was playing my role at home. We were still under the same roof, and while she slept on the couch, we had to pretend, for the sake of the kids, that everything was normal. It wasn't easy. Every time I saw her, I felt the rage boiling inside me, but I couldn't let it show. I kept my voice calm, my actions measured. I pretended to be the broken man, 
the husband who was trying to figure out if there was any way to save what little was left of our relationship. But inside, I was anything but broken. I was focused, driven by the need for revenge. Every moment I spent with her, I was planning how to destroy her world, and I knew exactly where to hit her where it would hurt the most. One of the things my wife had always prided herself on was her image. Despite the ups and downs of our marriage, she had always been seen as a devoted mother, an involved volunteer, someone who cared deeply for her family and community. AP's entrance into our lives hadn't just been about their affair. It had been about her sense of rebellion, about recapturing some lost part of her youth that she felt had been stolen from her when we became parents so young. She had always been respected, admired even, for how she had handled her struggles. But all of that was about to change. The second phase of my plan involved revealing the truth, not just to those close to us, but to everyone. I began drafting a letter, carefully worded and filled with evidence. Screenshots of the messages between her and AP, details of their affair, all of it laid out in cold, undeniable facts. I knew that if this information came out in the wrong way, it could backfire, making me seem like the bitter, scorned husband. But if I played it right, if I released it strategically, I could destroy her reputation without ever getting my hands dirty. The letter was addressed to several key people, her family, her closest friends, and even the volunteers at the Great Dane Rescue where she and AP had met. I included everything, leaving nothing to chance. I didn't embellish, didn't twist the truth. There was no need. The facts were damning enough. And when the time came, I would make sure that letter was delivered in a way that would leave her no room to explain, no way to recover. But that wasn't all. I needed to take it a step further. Ruining her reputation was just one part of the plan. I also wanted to make sure that, legally and financially, she would be left with nothing. The consultations I had with family law attorneys weren't just about divorce. They were about strategy. I wanted to know how I could ensure that, when I filed, I would have full custody of the kids, that I would keep the house, and that she would walk away with as little as possible. The lawyers gave me a clear path forward. In my state, infidelity could be used as grounds for divorce, and with the evidence I had, I would be in a strong position. I also began gathering financial documents, making sure I had a full picture of our assets and accounts. I knew that she had been using joint funds during her affair, taking AP out to dinner, buying him things, so I documented every purchase. I would use that to prove she had been misusing our finances, further strengthening my case. The last part of my plan involved AP himself. He was a wild card, unpredictable, volatile. While I had threatened him once before, I knew that he could still be a problem. He was on probation, and his life was already teetering on the edge of collapse. But I needed to make sure he stayed out of the picture. So I began gathering information on his probation violations, things I could use to ensure that if he ever tried to interfere again, he would be sent back to prison without hesitation. I had already warned him once, and now I was preparing to follow through on that threat if necessary. As I put the final pieces of my plan in place, I began to feel a strange sense of calm. The anger was still there, but it was controlled, sharpened into a weapon that I was preparing to use. My wife had no idea what was coming. She still thought she could somehow salvage our marriage, still believed that I might forgive her. But I had no intention of forgiving her. This was no longer about reconciliation. It was about revenge. And when the time came, I would make sure she lost everything just like she had made me lose everything when she chose AP over me. The first step in setting the trap was to push her deeper into her guilt, to get her to make mistakes that would only further my cause. I knew she was still talking to AP, though she had no idea I was monitoring every text message and phone call. The more I watched, the more obvious it became that she was trying to extricate herself from him, while simultaneously keeping him around as a backup plan. She was torn between her desire to save her marriage and the thrill of her affair. I intended to use that confusion to my advantage. I started with small gestures that would make her believe I was softening, that I might actually consider reconciliation. A cup of coffee in the morning, a quiet acknowledgement of her presence in the room, the small acts seemed to ease her tension, and over the next few days, I noticed her demeanor change. She thought I was coming around, that her apologies and remorse were working. But this was all part of the plan. She needed to feel comfortable to believe that she was still in control. The truth was, I wanted her to become careless. I needed her to slip up just once, 
to make a mistake that would give me even more leverage when I finally pulled the rug out from under her. My opportunity came sooner than expected. One evening, after the kids had gone to bed, I noticed her texting more frequently than usual. She sat on the couch, her face illuminated by the glow of her phone, the occasional smile flickering across her lips. I didn't say anything, just watched her from the corner of my eye as I pretended to read a book. My heart raced, knowing she was communicating with AP again. I wanted her to think I wasn't paying attention, that I had accepted her presence in the room as normal. But I had a plan to escalate things that night. When she finally went to bed on the couch, I waited a few minutes before slipping quietly into the living room. I knew she was asleep, and it didn't take much effort to unlock her phone using the pattern I'd learned from my monitoring. It was time to accelerate things. I sent a message to AP from her phone. I can't stop thinking about you. I wish we were together tonight. Can we meet up tomorrow while my husband is at work? It was cruel, perhaps, but necessary. I needed to push him. AP was an impulsive man, easily provoked and emotionally erratic, especially when it came to my wife. This message would get him excited, riled up, and most importantly, more careless than ever. I put the phone back where I found it and returned to my bedroom, lying awake as the minutes ticked by. My pulse was steady, my mind focused. I knew exactly how AP would respond, and I wasn't wrong. Within minutes, I heard the familiar ping of a new message on her phone. The next morning my wife was unusually chipper. I could tell she hadn't yet seen AP's reply, but that didn't matter. I had set the wheels in motion, and it was only a matter of time before they both walked right into the trap I had laid. I left for work, but instead of heading to the office, I parked down the street and waited. I knew that if things played out the way I expected, she would reach out to AP once she saw his enthusiastic reply to the message I had sent. She would arrange to meet him, likely during the window of time when the kids were at school and I was supposedly at work. A couple of hours passed and sure enough, I saw her car pull out of the driveway. I followed at a safe distance, watching as she drove toward AP's neighborhood. My pulse quickened with each turn she took and soon enough, I watched her pull into the same street where I had confronted him the first time. She parked outside his house, and I knew exactly what was happening. They still thought I was the naive husband, struggling to cope with her betrayal, but today they would learn just how far I had come. The moment I had been waiting for had arrived. I gave them time, 30 minutes, an hour, long enough to let them get comfortable, to think they were safe. Then I made my move. I walked up to AP's house, my steps slow and deliberate. I had no intention of knocking. Instead, I quietly made my way around to the back where I knew the sliding glass door led into his living room. My heart pounded in my chest, but I remained focused. This wasn't a confrontation. This was evidence collection. When I reached the sliding door, I could hear voices inside. My wife's voice. AP's voice. They were laughing, talking quietly, completely unaware of my presence. I crouched down, phone in hand, and snapped several pictures through the window, capturing them together on the couch. The final piece of my puzzle. Satisfied, I turned and walked back to my car, leaving them to their false sense of security. By the time they realized what had happened, it would be too late. I went back to work, sat down at my desk, and began drafting an email. Attached were the photos I had just taken, along with a carefully written explanation of what had been going on for the past year. I sent it to everyone on the list I had made, their mutual friends, the Great Dane Rescue, her family, our friends. I laid it all out, sparing no detail, attaching every piece of evidence I had collected over the past few weeks. The next few days felt like the calm before the storm, but I knew it was only a matter of time before the full weight of my plan came crashing down on my wife and AP. I had already set things in motion, and now all I had to do was watch it unfold. The first cracks in her facade appeared the morning after I sent the email. I woke up early as usual, pretending to head out for work, but instead, I waited. Sure enough, around 10 a.m., my phone started buzzing. I glanced at the screen and saw the messages pouring in. Friends, family, even her closest confidants, all shocked, confused, and disgusted by what they had learned. I could only imagine the panic that was setting in for her at that very moment. The betrayal, the lies, the affair. All of it laid bare for everyone to see. And the best part? She had no idea how it had all been exposed. I waited until mid-morning before I came back home. I could hear her on the phone as I walked through the door, her voice shaky and on the verge of tears. She was trying to do damage control, 
frantically calling her friends, her sister, anyone who would listen, trying to explain herself, trying to salvage her reputation. But it was too late. The truth was out, and no amount of backpedaling would fix the damage. When she saw me enter the house, she froze, her phone still pressed to her ear. Her face was pale, her eyes wide with fear and confusion. You knew, she said, her voice barely a whisper. I stared at her for a moment, letting the silence hang between us. Finally, I spoke, my voice cold and calm. Of course I knew. I knew everything. She looked like she was about to crumble, her hands shaking as she held the phone to her chest. Why? she whispered, her voice breaking. Why would you do this? Why? I repeated, a bitter laugh escaping my lips. Because you destroyed our family. You lied to me. You betrayed me. And you had the audacity to act like I was the problem. You thought I'd just walk away quietly, didn't you? You thought I wouldn't fight back. Her face crumpled, and for a moment I almost felt sorry for her. Almost. But the memory of the messages, the late nights, and the betrayal quickly erased any sympathy I might have had. I was going to try to work things out, she said, her voice trembling. I thought... I thought we could fix this. No, I said sharply, cutting her off. There's nothing left to fix. You made your choice, and now you're going to have to live with it. She collapsed onto the couch, burying her face in her hands as the reality of the situation set in. The weight of her actions was finally crashing down on her, and there was no escaping it now. But I wasn't finished. This was just the beginning. Later that afternoon, I made my way to AP's house. I had warned him once before, but now it was time to make good on my promise. I knew he was on probation, and I knew exactly what violations I could report. As I pulled up to his house, I saw his car in the driveway. A beat-up old thing he must have. Borrowed, since he usually relied on my wife for rides. I knocked on the door, and it wasn't long before AP answered. The moment he saw me, his face went white, and he stepped back as if he had just seen a ghost. What are you doing here? He stammered, clearly terrified. I'm here to make sure you understand the situation, I said, my voice low and even. I gave you one chance to stay away from my family, and you ignored it. So now, I'm following through on my promise. He swallowed hard, his eyes darting nervously around as if looking for an escape. Look, man, I don't want any trouble. I didn't mean for any of this to happen. I stepped closer, my eyes locked on his. It's too late for that. I've already collected everything I need. I've got the messages, the pictures, and a laundry list of probation violations I'm ready to send to your P.O. So here's how this is going to work. You're going to pack up, leave town, and never come near my family again. Because if you do, I'll make sure you're back in prison before the sun sets. His hands were shaking as he tried to form a coherent response. But I didn't give him the chance. You thought you could come into my life, steal my wife, and ruin my family without facing any consequences. But you're wrong. You're done. He stammered out a weak apology, but I wasn't interested in his excuses. I had already won, and now it was just a matter of finishing what I started. I suggest you start packing, I said before turning and walking back to my car. As I drove away, I glanced in the rearview mirror and saw him standing in the doorway, looking like a man whose world had just come crashing down. Good. The final phase of my plan was perhaps the most personal. It was time to meet with my lawyer. I had been preparing for this moment for weeks gathering evidence, making sure I had everything I needed to ensure that when I filed for divorce, my wife would be left with nothing. The messages, the photos, the financial records, all of it was ready to be used against her. When I arrived at the lawyer's office, I laid everything out on the table. The affair, the finances, the kids. I explained that I wanted full custody of the children, control of the house, and a divorce settlement that left her with the bare minimum. Given her unemployment and the fact that she had been using joint funds to support her affair with AP, I was in a strong position. The lawyer assured me that with the evidence I had, the court would likely rule in my favor. As we went over the details of the case, I felt a sense of satisfaction. It wasn't just about winning, it was about making sure she understood the full extent of what she had done. She hadn't just betrayed me, she had betrayed our family, our life together, and now she was going to pay the price for it. When I returned home that evening, my wife was sitting on the couch, her face pale and drawn. She had received calls all day from friends and family who had read the emails. Her reputation was in ruins, and there was no salvaging it. She didn't say a word as I walked past her, but I could feel the tension in the air. She knew what was coming. I didn't speak to her that night. And by morning, I had already packed a bag and left for work. But before I left, 
I made sure to leave the divorce papers on the kitchen table, along with a note. You chose him. Now, you can live with the consequences. The collapse was complete. Over the next few weeks, the divorce process moved swiftly, and my wife barely put up a fight. She had lost the support of her friends and family, and AP was long gone, having fled town after realizing I wasn't bluffing about turning him in. She was alone, without her lover, without her reputation, and soon, without her family. I was granted full custody of the kids, control of the house, and a settlement that left her with little more than the clothes on her back. The judge had seen through her lies, and the evidence I had collected sealed her fate. As I stood in the courtroom on the day the divorce was finalized, I felt a sense of closure wash over me. The woman who had betrayed me, the life I had built with her, was now nothing more than a distant memory. She had made her choices, and I had made mine. But while she was left with nothing, I still had everything that mattered, my kids, my home, and my dignity. And I had something else, too, a sense of peace that I hadn't felt in a long time. I had won. The collapse of her world had been inevitable, but it was no accident. It had been planned, calculated, and executed with precision. Now, as I stood on the other side of the chaos, I knew that I was free. Free from the lies, the betrayal, and the pain. And that, more than anything, was the ultimate revenge. The first few weeks after the divorce were quiet. My ex-wife had moved out, leaving the house that we had built together now fully mine. I had custody of the kids, who thankfully hadn't been fully exposed to the chaos that had played out. I kept things as normal as possible for them. Their world had already shifted enough, and they didn't need to see the uglier parts of what had happened between me and their mother. As for her, I didn't know exactly where she was. After losing everything, her reputation, her lover, her family, she had disappeared into the background, like a ghost in the life we once shared. Some mutual friends mentioned she was staying with a relative out of town, but beyond that, I didn't care to know. She had made her choices and now she had to live with the consequences.